So welcome to episode 44, live from my drum room with Dave Desenzo. It's a pleasure to see some folks watching. I'm going to bring Dave on in just a minute. I do have a couple of quick thank yous and announcements. Coming to you live, by the way, from Martha's Vineyard. And so far, so good with the, uh, the Wi-Fi internet connection here. So got some good lighting, got some good Wi-Fi, and I think we're going to be okay. All is going to be well. That was my biggest concern. Um, last week, I had a problem viewing the comments. So I'm hoping that's not going to be an issue today. If you're watching and you want to just send a comment along, if I'd appreciate that. So I just know it's working. And maybe I can fix it if it's not. No guarantees, though, on that. I see there are some folks watching. So maybe just type something out so I can see what you're saying. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Or not. Okay. Um, anyway, thanks for tuning in today on this beautiful day. And thanks for subscribing to my YouTube channel, getting close to that 1000 subscriber number. Dan Karanth. Okay, I can see you. Thank you. I'm seeing your comment. It's good. I think I think we're going to be okay. Uh, so we're closing in on that 1000 number. Just I think about 20 people away. So if you know 20 people, or if two of you know 10 people, or five of you know four people, tell them to subscribe. I, I want to get to that number. Or 10 of you know two people, or 20 of you know one person. You see where I'm going with this. Uh, thanks for watching uh, Rich Mangicaro last week. That was, that was a fun one, and, and uh, Rich really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And I thought it was, personally, I thought it was very interesting to have another uh, industry person on with me to kind of share experiences and great perspective going back that Rich has going back, you know, well into the 80s. So I thought that was a fun show. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have a confirmed guest, but I think I'm going to have someone lined up next week. So stay tuned for that. I came this close to having Charlie Drayton, who isn't available, and even closer to getting Mike Mangini next week. But something came up literally, I guess, last night or this morning with Mike's schedule in Dream Theater. So it's looking like Mike is going to be in August, and that's fine. Um, I think I'll still be doing this in August, so stay tuned for that. And uh, great, wow, okay, whole bunch of folks watching already. Well, what can I say about Dave Desenzo that a lot of you guys probably don't already know? Um, just a phenomenal um, all-around musician, just complete musician as a player, as an educator, as a composer, um, and add to that just an amazing human being just just one of my most absolute favorite people and drummers so uh, yes anthony this is going to be great so i won't take up any more time um, i'm going to welcome my good friend and the very handsome dave Desenzo. you hear me john i hear you dave i hear you too <laughs> And you are very handsome. Let me just, before we get started here. <laughs> You're letting your hair grow, too, I see. I meant to mention that earlier. Oh, yeah. All my all that thick, <laughs> luscious hair on the top of my head is growing back. <laughs> well, I, but I feel like you had it. Didn't you have it shaved for a while, or am I imagining that? No, no, I did. I, I, uh, I basically shave it and then let it grow as long as I can before it starts looking dumb and then i shave it again <laughs> i think That's it looks great <laughs> how's, how's your is your voice feeding back i mean bouncing back at you i'm hearing a little bit of an echo yeah, yeah. and what the heck that is man yeah, yeah. I, they, I was just googling it uh to try to figure something out and um it says if you're hearing the echo it's not on your end like it's not oh. anything that you're doing so but i'm not hearing you i'm not hearing you in the echo i'm just hearing my yeah. vocal that's strange i wish it was you and not me just because i can't stand hearing my voice coming back to me but hopefully it's distracting i know 
Yeah. It's a, but hopefully the guys watching, Anthony, Dan, and the rest of you guys, you're not hearing my voice echo, right? Yeah, give, um, us, a, give us a little chat. Yeah, give us a little a little feedback on that. Uh, but we got a, quite a bunch of folks watching already, Dave. This is great. Nice. And, you know, you've seen, I don't know if you've ever, ever watched one of these, but it's, I, I make a couple of notes ahead of time, but sure. really just a hang in a chat. That's nope. what it seems like. I mean, I unfortunately, I haven't been able to watch too many because I'm usually, you know, busy on it. Usually do them on Saturdays, right? I had been, yep. Yeah. So I've seen a couple. I saw the Steve Smith one. That was really cool. I saw that Rick Murata one, which was funny as hell and cool. <laughs> and I think I've seen one other one or clips, you know, bits of other ones. Um. But yeah, so I, I'm, I'm hip. I know what the I know what the, the John to Christopher podcast is like. I know you know what you're in for. Well, I may have to call Batman and Robin in. I know them. John, We're tight. John, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna put these. If it's the same, I'm just gonna put the in ears back in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do that. Absolutely. Do what's comfortable. And I'll keep talking. Ba, 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 ba. Yep, and it's still there. Okay. Do, 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 do. All right. All right. All right, John. Good, good, good. 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 So here, so we, here go. we go. Yeah, brother. We'll, we'll edit yeah, out all the, 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 uh, yeah. <laughs> the talk <laughs> about echoes. So yeah. we, were, we, were, we were talking off camera, camera off, off the air, about, about your dad, dad. and I was going to get into that a little bit later anyway. But I wanted to ask you, I know he was your first teacher, to just talk about like the impact that he had on you as a, as a, you know, as a drummer himself, growing up and, and that sort of an influence it had. Well, one of the things that is, um, that I've been thinking about a lot since he died was is um, how like my you know I think a lot of us who are musicians and and I suppose you could say this about other I'm sure you could say this about other occupations as well but my whole life including my social life and like all my friends everything has been based around music and uh and i'm just so grateful like he he was the first one in the family like there were no musicians in the family before him mm -hmm. and um and so in one way just by the nature of uh you know um the way things played out so to speak um you know him being a drummer and a teacher um and him teaching in the home the house i grew up in um it's you know and i took an interest and so in, in what i'm trying to say is in one sense it was just by nature of our relationship he was my dad i was his son and i followed that path into music and 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 I, I i've been thinking to myself i wish i just said to him uh thank you you know just thank you for i'm so grateful for uh for you having started all this you know started this this family uh path to music and uh so just again just by nature of our relationship he influenced me my entire life and from yeah. here till the day i die you know it, it, i feel like you know he lit a torch and uh and sort of lit the way and and it's you know i'm re just really grateful for that so so in in that sort of indirect way if you will 
huge and everlasting influence. And yeah. then in more direct and personal way, um, you know, I, I, he was just so supportive, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, him being a drummer himself, and mm -hmm. he was very supportive. He was, uh, you know, he, he, he you remember, um, at the the first time I played the Montreal Drum Festival, you know, he drove all the way up there with his buddy Rick. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, just to just to support me. And actually, he did it again. I think 2 years later I was back up there with my band mm -hmm. and he came as well as did my two brothers. The whole John family, Sanders. I think maybe your uncle too. That was it? that was Rick. That was my Oh, that was Rick. Rick. That was my dad's buddy Rick okay. Costa yeah and uh so um just so supportive and um he was a very organized guy he was he was very um disciplined and uh and and as a teacher um he being both organized and disciplined and it was he wasn't just dispensing knowledge there was there was uh it was more he was uh he was a creative guy and he didn't talk he talked about music he didn't just talk about drumming he talked about mm -hmm. us being musicians and um and and he gave me as well as anybody who studied with him uh a, a, a well-rounded start you know uh, so many teachers out there when they have a new student a, a beginner they don't have the patience or the wherewithal or whatever it is the desire to mm -hmm. to give that well-rounded perspective and it's so important you know because it's like this is your first f foray into this this uh this potential career path career path um if not even just um you know a lifelong hobby you know and so that's one of the greatest things uh i think he's done for all of his students is give them that that good footing, that solid footing from yeah. from the beginning, and uh, you know, other than that, I, I, just as a person, person to person, um, he was a great hang, as you you know. Um, he was a real loving guy, and uh, and you know, I I I, I hope I. I learned from that. He's extremely humble person, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, confident enough to do what needed to be done to, to provide and, and raise for provide for and, and raise a family. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if this came, if he came out of the womb this way or he learned this, but he was, you know, you see it when I like when I post on on uh, Facebook, for example, uh, uh, you know, when I post something about him and it's just like this outpouring yeah. uh, of love comes in the comments. And, um, you know, when we had a celebration of life, um, hundreds of people showed up um, and his, you know, his wake, there were hundreds and hundreds of people showed up so he just really put a lot of love out there and and uh and i've i've been influenced by that you know i think that's a beautiful thing uh the mm -hmm. world needs more people like that and i'm i'm hoping to carry on not just the the drumming tradition in the, in the family but but that um that aspect of it too the human yeah. aspect of it yeah that's that's, that's beautiful, beautiful dave that's, that's beautiful, beautiful. And, and and as we said off camera, camera you know i've just been, been thinking so much about your dad, dad. 
Um, so, you know, it's interesting, even I remember when he opened the store in 1982, I was working at, at Wurlitzer Music. And I'll just back up a second. I met your dad around 1980 when he was working for Harris Vandell or one of the local distributors. Like Grossman, I think, turned into Harris Vandell or something like that. And so I knew Dick as this legendary local teacher that a whole bunch of people that I, you know, customers and people that I knew on the South Shore had studied with, who was still an active teacher at the time, um, was coming in and, and he was like, we'd, we'd order, you know, Remo heads and sticks and things like that from him. And then he opened the shop in 1982. And you were at Wurlitzer at the time? Is that what you I was at Wurlitzer at the time. Yeah. And, and to give you an idea of how much everybody loved him, here's a guy opening a drum shop only, I don't know how far is Quincy from downtown Boston, 10 miles? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe 10 miles. Everybody was so happy that Dick Desenzo was opening a drum shop. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, it's uh, my boss at the time, this guy, Larry Green, um, your dad was working at getting the Ludwig line, but couldn't get it the day he opened, but he'd already had customers wanting to buy Ludwig from him. So we were getting Ludwig for him and just selling it to him at cost. No kidding. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember this and, and just stuff like that. So I, all these different six degrees of separation type things, but it's summertime now. And I, and I saw what you said about your dad on Father's Day and knowing that we were going to be doing this today, I start thinking about your dad. And I have all these just great memories of him, you know, just of our early relationship in that regard, where he would call me and say, you know, that voice, that baritone, hey, Johnny, uh, it's Dick Desenzo. Uh, just checking on that, on the, uh, the, you know, the order, the Ludwig order or something. And um, in those days, too, Wurlitzer didn't pay its bills, so we were like on credit hold, and I'm having explained to your dad, <laughs> and he understood, but it, he wasn't happy. Like he totally, he's like, "Oh, gee, any idea when, when I can?" I said, "Well, we're trying to, I'm trying to get them to pay the bill so we can release that and some other customer stuff." And so you know, it all worked out in the end. Um, but I didn't know that, John. I yeah, didn't know you yeah. knew him prior to Zildjian, like prior to you working at Zildjian. Yeah. Well, and then when I, I'll, and this, this is about you, not about me, but I actually started to really get to know him when I moved back from LA in 88 and I was working for DW and I would call on him uh, for DW stuff. And that's I, when I think I first saw you play, but maybe not. I, I think you seem to recall it was a different uh, time, but I thought you, I remember seeing you doing something with Joe Franco at your dad's store. It, it, so I think you're conflating a couple of okay. different clinics, basically. Happens you know, when you get old, Dave. You know what I, <laughs> you know what I bet you're thinking of is, because when Joe Franco um, did his clinic at the drum shop, <clears throat> I was going to say he, I think he did it just by himself. Uh, I don't think there was okay. like a, an opener. And, uh, but I think a year or two before that, um, I know it was 87, so I don't remember exactly when Joe Franco did his thing, but I know the thing I did was, oh, I opened for Jonathan Mover. Okay. I didn't, I don't think I saw that. That was in 87, you said. Yeah. yeah. I was still out there. Okay. You were still. Oh, you were still out in L.A. I was still in L.A. But but I I saw you. Maybe I saw you do something in '89, on your own, a Tama kit. Um, yeah 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 yeah. The gunmetal gray Tama kit or was it? Yeah white? yeah. And it was. Okay. I I'd heard about you. I hadn't seen you play, but I'd heard about you from a whole bunch of people, and it was completely mind blowing, floored. And you were only 20, maybe at the time, or maybe 21, yeah, 20 or 21. I was 89, I was 21. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, prob that's probably what you're thinking of. Because I okay. did do, um, the reason I asked if it was a gray kit or, or a white kit, because I, you know, I, I have a crazy uh, detailed memory of the past. <laughs> my my short-term memory is, is not as good as it once was but but man 
I have I have memories just embedded deeply from a long time ago. So anyway, that that clinic I did with with uh, Jonathan Mover, Zildjian, in fact, had loaned me. Oh, I think I think so. Jonathan was a Tama endorser. Yeah. yeah. And I I did not have an endorsement yet, and um, and so they wanted a uh, Jonathan. I guess they had a kit they were going to provide for Jonathan. Zildjian did, and they sent it to my parents' house, where I was still living, and practicing in the basement. And I got to practice on this really nice Tama Art Star, those single lugged yeah. Uh, uh, kit and uh, it sounded really good and uh, and so I, I practiced for like a week on that kit before the clinic and and so I remember that that was the Jonathan Mover thing and then I did one on my own a couple of years later with that gray kit which I had bought brand new in 89 okay, okay. yeah so, so I'm, yeah, yeah I think you're right I think I'm conflating yeah well, yeah, it was yeah. a bunch of yep. freaking curly-haired, long-haired, you know, like <laughs> black-haired drummers. <laughs> Between me, Mover, and uh, and Joey Franco, yeah. 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 Oh, that's, <laughs> that's funny. Really... I just tried just switching, switching my mic just to see if it would fix it, but it didn't seem to do it. To do it. Oh, okay. John, I'm sorry that's, that's right. happening. I hope it's, I hope it's not on my end. No, I don't, no, I think, don't think it is. It is. Uh, John, John Medeiros, Medeiros says, says there's an echo when I, when I speak, speak, my microphone picking up my computer, computer speakers. speakers. No, because the, the sound is coming through my earbuds, not, not through the computer, computer speakers. speakers. But anyway. What makes me think it's on my end is this has never happened for you before, right? Yeah, yeah but, but it, 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 there's a first, first time for everything, time. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> So let me, I have to tell you another quick story about your dad. So uh, Carlos Guzman from the Bat Cave. Okay. So that same year that I moved back from LA working for DW in 88, I'm visiting your dad's store, Johnny, my son, who's maybe your biggest fan in the world, who was 18 months old. I wanted to buy him a Remo Junior Pro drum set. And it was around, I don't know, early December, and I couldn't find one anywhere. Remo didn't have any. I called Rick Drum out there and, and uh, Lloyd McCausland and all the friends I had at Remo. And they're like, oh, you know, we're back ordered or blah, blah, blah. I call your dad. And I think he said something like, you know, Johnny, boy, yeah, they're, I, I have some coming in or they're hot or whatever it is, you know, hard to get. I know I got a phone call a day or two later and said, I, I have one here for you, if, if you know. And he never really told me what he did, but he figured something out. I was so excited. I drove down there. I got it. Um, and it was he was the only guy that could make it happen. I feel like I, I called some other local dealers and people that I was calling on, and they were all kind of like laughing. Are you kidding me? You know, this was Christmas time. Yeah, Christmas time. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, I've I've heard, I've heard a good you know handful of two over the years stories over the years like that you know just him coming through for people and you know yeah. people re relaying stories like that how grateful like even if it was just like uh you know some some tension screws that that were period specific or something you know like dorky like drum <laughs> nerd stuff where people are pulling their hair out trying to find something and and uh and my dad came through yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. now he was I, I just he was so I, I guess to your point too you know he's so organized and and uh, and you know dependable I think about like when you were talking about we, we do clinics and things like that with him and and he was so detail oriented like right down to exactly when things were going to arrive and and what, you know, just, just all, all that, that stuff. stuff. He was, he was, uh, I would say, borderline OCD about that stuff. Just yeah. um, on top of everything. Um, I have in the other room, um, he used to put out this thing called the drumogram. Yeah. You know, 
<laughs> and man, he and my mom put so much time into those mailers. You know, they were mailers, you know? Yeah. And uh, really extensive. And any any clinics that had happened, he incorporated them into the drumogram with, with text. And um, it was just, you know, a lot of effort. He put a lot of effort into doing the best that he could do. And, uh, and again, I just... So much of that effort, that that caring that he put out, it just all keeps coming back. You know, it it, yeah. it made an impact. He really was kind of a a, a rock star on the South Shore of Boston. So to speak. absolutely, yeah. And 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 even beyond too. I you know, it's cool to see so many people like Ralph Angelillo up in Montreal, as you as you mentioned. You know, the Drum Fest, who got to know your dad through having you there and. And, uh, and 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 people learned of his of his legendary status on the South Shore, kind of yeah. around the world, you know. It, you know it, that's true. I I I think of um, like doing clinics um, in different parts of the states, for example, where at meet and greets, people would come up to me and say, you know, I had your dad's book back in the you know the early seventies, and that was like the book that was the the main book I taught out of you know yeah and that's another thing he published his first book in 1971 well his only book but he updated he did an updated edition in the 80s i think but in 71 he published this book called the practical workbook or a practical workbook for the modern drummer and you know i've written i've published two books and i'm finishing up a third right now and and I would, I would, I would give my stuff to him, and uh, you know, before I publish it and see what he thought. And my God, he would always just like tear my shit apart. Like, yeah. you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta make this more presentable. You gotta do this. You gotta do that. And I'd be like, you know, inside, I'd be like, I don't want to hear that, you know, because I'd be busting my ass trying to, you know, do the best I could, and he would just, you know. He he he'd set me straight, and uh, at one point I went back and looked at his book for the first time in a long time, and I was like, "Wow, this guy! He just... I don't think I'm the best book writer. I think I've written some a couple of good books. I think this third one's going to be my best one. But he had a way of just like, it's hard for me. It's hard to put what I teach in between two, you know, a front mm -hmm. and back cover. It's just hard for me. And uh, he just did such an amazing job of it. If, you know, you look at that book, and I saw a Modern Drummer um, review of his book, uh, uh, re, you know, after he passed. Um, and it's like, great review, and the guy, the guy even said, I forget who did it, but he said, you know, he mentioned something to the effect of like, this was no easy feat to do what to what Dick DeCenso did with this mm -hmm. book to something about the the um, the ex the expansiveness of it, but the concise and organized manner in which he presented it. And uh, it's true. It's it's really true. He he. I think he was better at it than I was. Uh, and well, it's funny, you know, I've got, um, I've had some younger former students and now colleagues of mine who are writing books. And I've shared some of w just direct quotes from my dad, you know, uh, about how to make their product better. Yeah. Kind of cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Well, I, I, I would go along with everything you said, just in terms of how I knew him. Just he was such a, um, you know, all all those things organized, detail oriented, um, and really knew how to. Um, I, like I, I remember we would we would be on the phone. He he loved I I love the fact that he was old school about stuff too. Like we'd go over the details over the phone, 
and and he'd want to know if we're talking about Ralph Humphrey, who's coming in for a clinic, he'd say, you know, Johnny, give me some of his background. Give me, you know, I, I want to, you know, he, and he would write his own bio for Ralph, you know, to promote it, to put in the, in the drumogram, you know, and, and, and those kinds of, and he really took it so seriously because he wanted to present to his students, to his customers, to everybody in the South Shore, like the best clinic and the best event. And it was at a time when, when, you know, people really took that seriously. Like it was a really important thing, education. And, um, and he, and that's the other thing too. He was always very education oriented when it came to, to drum clinics. He wanted, he didn't want necessarily, and this is no reflection on anybody, but someone that was maybe the most popular drummer of the day. He wanted someone that was going to impart information and knowledge to his students and his customers. Yeah. You know, I dug that so much. One thing that comes to mind just now is, is as you were talking is, is um, so I just spent the weekend with my mom um, and, and she pulled out a box of his memorabilia that I've never seen. And, uh, and, and a lot of it was like, um, you know, he was on community auditions. There's a ticket stub from 1955 of him. Wow. You know, he, you know, this guy, he was 14 years old in 55. His parents didn't own a car. So I don't know how he got into Boston to, to, to do the, the show, but like he made it happen at 14 years old, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there's a letter from the people at community auditions, you know, how much they enjoyed his performance. Like he, I don't know if he won or, or what, what, what it was, but, um, and then there's like early documents, uh, that he, that my dad saved from, uh, like the Quincy Glee Club where he had performed and won a scholarship, you know, towards furthering his education and, and music and, and. It just occurred to me when you were talking that, like, I think drumming and music, uh, not to sound, it's almost a, a, a cliche, but I think in a way it, I don't know if I'd say it saved his life, but it, I think, he, you know, he, he, it gave him purpose and, and I think mm. he had to fight for it a, a little bit. I think he was supported but uh, by his parents, in fact, I know he was. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to say. But I, I, I know that it was really important to him, um, music and and, mm. and and drumming and and. Uh, and I think he was very grateful. That's what I'm trying to get. I yeah. think he was very grateful that he found music, and uh, and I I know it gave him a, a it was a very prominent driving force in his yeah. life throughout his life, and I think that had probably a lot to do with how why he was so fervent in spreading it to as many people as he could as as well as he could yeah you know that's that's, that's makes, makes perfect, perfect sense, sense Dave. that's very interesting too yeah. yeah and that's just what he did too i mean it was it was like a contagious thing with him yeah it really was and then you you said earlier like he um he was so serious about it and then which was true and then on at the end of the day he could he would let his hair hang down. He was a good, yeah. He was a good hang. He was a great hang. He was a great hang. <laughs> I have to tell you, I may not have told you about this. If Jerry Donegan is watching this, I he he could be because I he watches a lot of these. Jerry Donegan is an old friend of mine from Zildjian. He was the vice president of sales for many many years. At worked at Zildjian almost forty years. But um, right after your dad sold the shop to South Shore Music. Still, still Descenzo's drum shop, he was still involved. We were planning the Steve Gadd clinic that we had there in 2007, maybe, I think it was. 
In Quincy, yeah. yeah. I think you came toward the end. You were you had a gig, or you were somewhere, and I think you made it. I saw you afterward. Yeah, yeah. I feel like yeah. Well, so yeah, some months before that, um, Jerry Donegan, myself, your dad, and Peter. Uh, Volpe. Volpe, sorry, sorry, Peter, if you're watching, Peter Volpe of Celestial Music went to lunch at a place that your dad loved to go to in Quincy kind of right off uh, the highway. Yeah, do you know the place I'm talking about? Um, Near Furnace Brook Parkway. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm trying yeah. to remember the name of it. it, it I, I couldn't, yeah. yeah, like an old school great restaurant yeah. on, a, on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. And we drank martinis at like one in the afternoon on a school day. <laughs> On a school oh, day, yeah. On a school day. And I think I think Peter was the only smart one who kept it to one. And I think Jerry and your dad and me went for the second round and and we weren't feeling anything. I'm, my wife is not far away and she's probably gonna yell at me later for this, but but we drank lots of coffee and we were make sure to be okay. we were okay to drive home. But uh, but anyway, that was maybe the the last sort of old time yeah, sort of hang we had like that, you know, yeah. where he really let his hair down, like you said, just so many laughs and yeah. Yeah. If he, when he, we're not, we're not trying to promote, you know, alcohol here. No, groups, no. but no. when my dad had a, had a couple, it's like, you know, it just, it just, what do they call that? A, like a, a lubricant. Like he just was. Yeah. Um, he would get silly, you know, all that seriousness would just like, yeah, go out the window. And he, you know, he was, he loved telling jokes. He was a good joke teller. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, he, um, you know, when I got married, um, my bachelor party, I didn't want to do a sort of typical bachelor party. I just had my dad. And uh, a couple of my closest friends, uh, and we hung out. We went out for a, a nice uh, Italian meal at a um, place called. Uh, oh man, I forget. I forget what it was called. It's a great Italian restaurant on. I think it was on Three A in Qu North Quincy. Um, Tulio's, I think it was called. Mm. And uh, and then we went back to my apartment in Milton and we pulled an all nighter. <laughs> he slept over. He called he called my mom at like two in the morning all pie eyed. I have a picture of him on the phone all pie eyed with this big shit eating grin on his face talking to my mom saying, I'm not coming home tonight. <laughs> I never heard that. That's outstanding. Oh, oh. so much fun. Yeah he, yeah, he could really hang. Um, so yeah, man, I you know, I, I love talking about my dad, and I I want to share this too. I, I, maybe it's just kind of selfish, but I just I I wished that I told him before he died how much I appreciated what he. The, the path that he laid out that I didn't have to go down that path, you know, but I wanted to. And he, mm. he laid that out and, um, and I, I, so I wish I had really expressed that to him, just looked him in the eye and at one point and just said, dad, I just want to thank you. Cause, cause you know, a lot of the time that he and I hung out, he would he would he would be all business. He'd be asking me about how my books were going and how the gigs going and what's new and it was a, and and it was at a time where uh, I remember specifically a period of time where I was just like I don't know that I ever said this to him, but Dad, I, I, you know, but in my mind I was like, Dad, I don't want to talk about business and you know music mm. and, <clears throat> and but I think he got the 
I think he got that impression like that. Maybe I just, you know, I just didn't really want to talk about it. And, um, and I think it was a period of time in my life. Like right now, I'm in kind of a, a nerdy phase, if you will, where I, I like talking drums and I like mm. talking shop. And, um, and there was this long stretch where I had just was so out of that headspace. And so, you know, I, I, like I told friends at the time, like, you know, I'd have, a, I have this great friend, uh, Bill, who is a, m just a mad scientist thinker. And he's always thinking and taking me to places that I'm like, dude, I never even thought of that, you know? And even with Bill, there was a time during this time, I was like, Bill, he'd ask me a question. And, and, and I, my brain would just get like, start to tie yeah. itself in a knot. And I'd be like, Billy, I can't do this right now. I can't, I, I can't, I don't want to, I don't want to think this hard. And I don't want, if I'm going to think this hard, I don't want it to be about drums right now. Hmm. And I, so I went through this period and, and I, you know, by the time I came out of it, he, my dad was sick. Mm. and um within the period the, the the period of time between finding out he was sick and and him actually dying was five months it happened really fast so there was mm. and in that five months me and my two brothers and and our significant others were like a conference calling, you know, and searching online for alternative thing. It's just like everything mm. for that five months went into how can we save his life? You know, yeah. is there anything we can do? And in hindsight, you know, probably wouldn't do it any differently if it happened again, but it would have been nice to maybe take some of that time and just like been with him. And, and talked with him. Um, and and well, so my, my point is, um, I, I wish that I could have shown more appreciation for him to his face uh, while he was alive. And that is a that is a, a regret. And I'm okay with regrets. You know, the, the people who say don't have any regrets and I don't think I could do that. I, I do have some regrets, and that's one of them. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I don't know. Somehow, I think, that's why I said this might be a little selfish, because I just wanted to express that uh, out openly, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally understand what you're saying, Dave, and, and if you'll permit me to say it, I think... You thank your dad so many times in so many ways. Um, I, I was there for a lot of these times. I mean, I, I remember PASIC 1991 at Disneyland in California. Wow. When you, yeah. yeah. Probably the, you know, I don't care who's watching, it's probably the greatest drum solo I've ever seen played at a PASIC ever and that I will ever see. And that is on tape somewhere, right? I have that on on VHS somewhere, you know. Okay, you you, you know, should I, I'm, I'm you should put that out because I I'm not I'm not imagining that. That was like otherworldly. Thanks, John. You're welcome. In fact, you probably you never played that great again. again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really was. It was. <laughs> no, it wasn't downhill. It was off the friggin' chain. It was unbelievable. I, I, can I share something with you about that day? Yeah. Um, this is a good memory. Uh, so after after I did my performance, and I think after the whole competition was over, um, I'm in the bathroom, and I'm I'm going to the bathroom at the you know I'm at the the urinal and and uh, and Ed Soaf walks in. Oh. And he's like, he steps up a couple urinals over and and uh he we look at each other and he's like hey man 
that was that was great you know something like that and he's like you know you made harvey mason go woo when you were doing that when you were playing and he said when harvey goes woo you know you you're a badass and and i was like thanks you know thanks man you know i really appreciate that uh i just thought that was a funny story like ed and i go in the bathroom next to each other having a, <laughs> having a moment I didn't, I didn't yeah, know, the yeah and i didn't know ed i mean i know knew of him but you know sure. Sure, i didn't know who he was um so yeah well thanks john yeah and 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 my dad was there for that he you know yeah. he you know i could have gone out to PASIC by myself uh he could have you know he didn't have to go he wanted to go you know right. and i'm so glad he did and I, I, Dave, I remember he was beaming. He was, we were all beaming. We were all, but he was, I mean, think about it. If, like if Leo went out and did a, you know, played in a competition and just completely floored everybody, what you'd feel like. And your, your dad was just, yeah, he, he was beaming. And, and, and I think like years later, like we talked about Montreal Drum Fest and, and, uh, and, and he, yeah, he came when you played by yourself that first time. And then when Two Ton Shoe came up, yeah, yeah, it was, it was that's yeah. those are such proud moments for a dad, you know. Yeah, yeah, and such great great memories for a son. I'll give you another one. In 1988, I went to the Drummers Collective. Mm. And I and I I was going to do a certificate program and I ended up just studying privately with um with uh, Kim Plainfield with Kim God rest his soul. Yeah. Um, with Rod Morgenstein, with uh, Frank Malabe, Ricky Sebastian. Um, who else? There were a couple other guys. You know, I was going to, like I said, I was going to do this certificate program, but then I, within the first week, I was like, you know, I don't want to do this. And they allowed me to just put all the money I had paid for the certificate, certificate program to private lessons. So I just took private lessons for like two months while I was there. And uh, was Zach there? Zach Danziger? Zach, yeah. Yeah, Zach okay, Danziger. yeah, yeah. He was 17, I want to say. Yeah. I was 19 or 20. And, and, oh, so here's a good story. So the, 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 uh, the director, uh, a guy named Brad Flickinger, I think his last mm. name was, mm -hmm. uh, it's the first day. And, I don't remember if I had, you know, classes that day or what was going on. I just remember being in the lobby and Brad walking out from behind the, the desk and taking me to this room and where Zach was. And he, he, it's like he just like, he, it's like he opened a cage door and just threw me in with a lion. It was like, go hang out with a lion, dude. <laughs> And, and so this was, this was, um, like I said, 88. So j just, you know, a couple years prior, uh, Chick Corea's electric band album had come out and I was mm. a little late to the party. So I just was getting into it in like 87. And this was the first time in my life at that point where I had heard music that I was interested in, that I liked. I was like, this is cool. Mm. And I didn't know what the drummer was doing. Because prior to that, you know, I could figure out Neil Peart. Mm -hmm. I could figure out pretty much anything that I had encountered except for jazz, which I was still confounded by at this point. Um, but I didn't care. Like when my dad had, was listening to jazz records, you know, I was like, I had these, you know, like, you know, uh, novice thoughts, uh, thoughts of a novice. Like, how do these guys know where they are? You know, mm. how, what's going on here? Like, you know, why is this so long? And where's the melody? And, you know, I was, because I, I was a product of 
70s radio, you know. My mom had a freaking transistor radio on top of the fridge. It was on WBVF, I think it was. Yeah. And, yeah. Or ROR. Like, it was two stations. And you heard everything from from Stevie Wonder to The Who to The like, Commodores. It's like yeah, you yeah. everything, you know, everything that had a backbeat. You could hear on one station. Yeah. yeah. And and I loved it. I was all about the melodies. I didn't even care about the drumming so much yet, you know. I was all about the melodies and the harmony and 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 so so I just didn't understand jazz, but I didn't care. So Weckl and and on that Chick Corea album, and maybe Gad just before that on the on the Friends album, I think my yeah. brothers had hit me to that. I didn't understand it. And so now Brad throws me in with Zach and there's this kid <laughs> like playing all that shit with his own like like Zach's got a an attitude in you know we all do I suppose you know we all play who we are um so he was doing all that shit but it, there was you know there was definitely a, a, a he he was putting his own little slant on it and then we all know where Zach went like Zach just went pew, like he could have been you know fusion star drummer you know of the 80s and the 90s uh, but he went in his own direction but he hadn't gone in that direction yet so mm. he's playing all that shit and I was just like he Brad sent me into trade fours. That's what it was, with Zach. <laughs> and after a few go arounds, I was like, I just stopped, and I was like, Do you mind if I just listen to you? And and uh, and I think I had my my Radio Shack realistic tape recorder as well. It was like this big. I used to bring this freaking thing everywhere to like the bottom line and to Chris uh, to the fifty five bar. This hunk of freaking plastic. Um, and, and I'd record, you know, it was the first time I saw Dennis Chambers and, and Dennis, you know, Dennis was like one of the first ones, if not the first that gave me the impression to myself, like, you know, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I still didn't understand the Weckl Gad thing. Um, and it was predominantly the, the the Afro Cuban Brazilian influences that they were bringing into the fusion drumming that they were doing. It was that stuff that I didn't quite get. Yeah. But Dennis wasn't doing so much of that. It was more like backbeat and occasional yeah. swing. Um, so yeah, man, you know, I, ha I still, I think I still have a lot of these tape re recordings. In fact, I would go down to this place on Bleecker street to see Zach play with Hiram Bullock every like, <sighs> You know, he had a, a, like a house once a week, you know, like a Thursday night, something mm -hmm. or other. And, uh, yeah, I'd go down there with my hunk of plastic and, and record and, <laughs> and, you know, go back to my, my boarding house room. I lived in this boarding house for like, well, however long I was there, like two and a half months. And, uh, and I'd listen and I'd try to transcribe and stay up all night, uh, you know, just nerding nerding yeah. nerding nerding and trying to get the stuff so that was a significant memory too is you're right yeah zach was there and, and yeah i was great, great experience. experience i was blown away by him yeah and you know to your point about dennis i'm i'm no i you know you have more ability in your a quarter of your fingernail than i could ever dream to have but my first impressions of hearing dennis is similar to what you're saying in that he the stickings, you could sort of understand what he was playing, you know, like whether it was singles or doubles and, and, and his jazz beat, but it was the speed at which he played it at that was so mind boggling to, to hear someone play at that time. Other than Billy Cobham on records, I'd seen Billy maybe one or two times, but seeing Dennis in a small club and playing all that stuff. Uh, whereas like, like you say, Dave and Steve, they were playing these really new kind of to fusion anyway rhythms that you didn't yeah. typically hear yeah so yeah i totally i see what you're saying yeah and um frank malabe uh, again god rest his soul yeah. too he died a long long time ago uh, 
that died a young man. He hipped me, and actually Zach, I think, helped me too. Just, you know, hipping me to these rhythms, uh, these African, predominantly African rhythms, um, and how they were being put on the drum set by these different drummers. That helped a lot. Um, in decoding what I was hearing. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and mind you, 1988, you know, I showed up with long hair, ripped jeans. I remember my dad saying to me, you know, David, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, son, I don't know if, if you're making the best uh, impression, you know, wearing these ripped jeans, you know, going to the, to, to the collective. And, you know, I was full on metal. Um, I was like just really headlong into my, into metal. And that was like, in hindsight, that was my metal sort of stage. I eventually moved uh, uh, away from that. But, um, and I remember, uh, I remember Rod Morgenstein showing up uh, to his, to our first lesson. And he had ripped jeans on. <laughs> I, I called my dad and I told him, I was like, you'll never believe what Rod Morgenstein was wearing at us at our first lesson today. Uh, <laughs> and, that's uh, such a 20 year old kid thing, thing. You know, it's yeah, perfect. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, and more to the point though, is like, I was just, you know, it's like music is like uh, different styles of music are like different accents on the same language you know you, you you know like scottish people i remember my first european tour i had a scottish tech and this guy was speaking english and i f- understood maybe 10 percent of what he was saying all the time mm. so it's kind of like that you know he's speaking english like like gad playing his mozambique was speaking rhythm speaking drum language but i didn't get the accent you know, I didn't get that vernacular. Mm, yeah. And so going to the collective at that time, being sort of set in a certain way and, and being good at, like I could play that way and I was well practiced at that. It's, uh, it was almost like culture shock in a way, you mm-hmm. know, uh, just, uh, being exposed to all that stuff and then doing the work to, 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 to be able to speak with that accent in that vernacular. Uh, and it took me a while, you know, I came home after that and I had all, I had my songos and my Mozambiques and my Wawankos and all this stuff and the Batucada and the Bayao. And here's a good, here's a good story too, before I even got back. One day I'm in the I'm in a practice room, and I'm working out all my my Afro Cuban Brazilian stuff, and and I'm thinking like you know, I was feeling good about it, mm. and I walked out of the room after like you know I was sweating, and I was in there for a couple hours. So I finally take a break. I walk out of the room, and this guy, this French guy who was one of the students there, he was older than me, by about five years, and he says thoughtfully he says you know dave you know everything you everything you play sounds like rock <laughs> and i was like okay you know i don't even remember how i responded but i remember not fully understanding what he was saying and it took me a couple of years to 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 realize that to recognize what he was saying yeah and yeah. It, he was he was spot on <clears throat> you know it's like you can learn the words of a different vernacular, if you will, but that doesn't mean you're going to sound, you know, authentic. Mm -hmm. And so that was really a a great experience for me in terms of uh, being the beginning of me really evolving beyond... um, you know what? I don't want to say that because it sounds condescending, but just uh, just becoming a more well-rounded musician. It, you know, it wasn't it wasn't easy. 
but it, yeah. it was fun. It was, it was fun. I, you know, but they, yeah. So anyway, that, that was a great experience. The collective was awesome. Kim Plainfield was awesome. He eventually became a good friend of mine, actually, when he yeah. eventually came to teach at Berkeley and I was teaching there already. Um, and then, uh, just going out at night in the village, um, just, you know, I could walk anywhere I wanted to go or take a train right. um, and see. I saw Peter Erskine for the first time, your buddy, our buddy yeah. Peter. Yeah. Um, Dennis, Danny Gottlieb, I saw him for the first time. Joel Rosenblatt, I saw Joel play with Michelle Camilo. And that was really, you know, so that was like, so like I said, I wanted to become a, 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 a fusion drum. I wanted to be able to play like Weko and, and, and Vinny and, and those guys doing that. And, and, mm -hmm. and Rosenblatt, who I'd never even heard of at the time. What a monster. Yeah. 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 Um, he's a great guy too. Yeah. So I told him that, you know, I ran into him a couple years ago and, and, uh, he actually came up to me. I, if I remember correctly, he came up to me and was like, man, you such a monster. And I was like, Joel <laughs> Rosenblatt, man, like I saw you, you know, 30 years ago, man, and you blew me away. And he was so humble. And, um, but yeah, man. So, you know, that was like right exactly where I need, where I wanted to be, you know, going to see a guy like, Joel Rosenblatt playing all that shit with uh, yeah. with Michelle Camilo. So anyway, uh, and and I think where we got how we got here was my dad took me. You know, we took the Amtrak train down like a month before I was to go, or maybe it, maybe it wasn't. Maybe he just went there with me and then left me there and went home. But I remember. I had forgotten this completely. A friend of mine who now lives in New York City, he's recently moved there with his family, he took a picture of a, a cross street that he was on, and one of the cross streets was Tito Puente Way. Yeah. yeah. And it just shot me back to that night, to that time when my dad took me down to New York. Um, and uh, he took me to the, to, to, uh, uh, the Blue Note down in the village and mm. and uh we saw carmen mccray um and and the other show we saw at the blue note within that same like couple day time span you know and that speaks to the man as well like he didn't just take me down and make sure i was cool and situated he like took me out too and he yeah. made plans to like you know he got the tickets and we went and saw tito puente's full band oh man at 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 the blue note so, you know, I'm he was so making sure you, stuff. you knew, yeah, he was, he was, he was totally was making sure you knew what you had at your disposal, you know, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. is the scene. And then, yeah. uh, you know, prior to that, you know, he took me to see Rush in 1982, I think it was. So I would have been 14, maybe it might've been 83. It was the Signals tour, whatever year that was. Mm -hmm. He got us tickets, 14th row on the floor at the Boston Garden. Wow. We were standing on our wooden chairs the whole time. <laughs> yes. Freaking like the 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 marijuana was like flowing, like it was a fishbowl. And we're standing on our chairs, man, and Getty's like right there, and Alex is right there, and Neil's right there. And on the way in. We're driving up 93, says, you know, Davey, I'm really excited about tonight, but I wish we were going to see Bonham tonight because John Bonham had just died, you know, a couple of years oh, prior to that. Right. So, you know, he knew what I was into, and yet he went and, and it's like he was culturing me. Like he went and he didn't take me to go see, you know. Uh, just, just the guys, the guys he liked. liked. Yeah, you know? yeah. Louis Belson or, or Peter, Peter or any, yeah. yeah. He hipped me to 
you know, Carmen McRae and, and, and Tito Puente, just in that short little time we had together mm -hmm. down in New York in that weekend. So, and, and again, these are things that I wish that I reflected on and shared with him and, and just told him how grateful I was. And, and, you know, I hope he knew, but, but I still, I could have, I could have, you know, I, 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 yeah. opened my mouth more and, and just made sure that he, he knew. So I'm grateful, 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 grateful for him. I, I know you are, I, and and I, I and I know what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not I'm not trying to talk you out of what you're saying about that. But I I know that he was just so proud and so uh, knew how much you appreciated what he did for you. I I, I do. I just I, I know that. I just know that. Um, I, I I I was thinking about like I want to say it was like 30 years ago seeing you at the channel with Ultra Blue. Um, just all these, all these memories of, and I, I, I could be imagining either your dad was there or one of your brothers. Like there was always somebody in your family there. I, it seemed like when I would go see you with two ton shoes somewhere or, or like I, but ultra blue, I want to say that was like such a, a departure for me to see you that way. It was the first time I saw you playing a bass drum, a snare drum, a hi hat and one cymbal. Does that sound right? That was probably two ton shoe. That was okay. So with Ultra Blue, you didn't play the the small. No, you didn't. Okay, I'm I'm getting that was a, that was a little before. Uh, that was before. Like Ultra Blue was, I think I joined that band in ninety three. No, 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 no. That was ninety one because I played, I play, I joined Fahrenheit. Uh, in 91, Muzz, our buddy yeah. Muzz, went to play with the Fools. Right. And uh, and Fahrenheit was sort of on its last leg, and um, they had already been signed and dropped and went through that whole experience. And and uh, But they were still going. They still had management, and we played all over the place. And I played with them for about 18 months, and I had such a good time. Oh, my Great God. Band. So yeah. much fun. It's always been my my favorite thing as a drummer has always been to play great songs behind a great singer. And uh, I loved a lot of the Fahrenheit songs. And Charlie Farron was uh, is a, a phenomenal singer. Yeah. And uh, so that was so much fun. But anyway, uh, Robert Holmes was playing in Fahrenheit at the time. Okay. okay. Yeah. So. Um, and who was I think Brock Avery was playing drums with Ultra Blue and I think Brock went west that's right. that's right yeah he went west at that time and so you know Robert needed a drummer and uh, so yeah that from about 91 to about 94 95 I, I was playing with, with okay. Ultra Blue and uh, and then a few years later well, in 95, Two Ton Shoes started, and a couple years after that, I went to that two-piece, just kick, snare, hat, and a crash ride. Yeah, okay. So you must have seen that. I definitely saw that a, a bunch of times, and, and I guess I was, like you say, conflating as usual. <laughs> but I, with, with Ultra Blue, were you still playing a, maybe a smaller kit than what I remembered from, like, the cro -Mags days? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Like, definitely a scaled down maybe a four piece or something yeah it was like a probably a four well i think it was two up one down i think it was a five okay. piece kit one bass drum though i remember there was this you know i went through this period where um <laughs> it's it's so immature in hindsight it was an immature thing and i'm cool with it like i'm not like beating up on myself but uh i just was i had this sort of mission in my head to make people think I was playing double bass when I wasn't. I think that's cool. <laughs> it's cool, but you know, like it wasn't necessarily, I wasn't always necessarily making the best decisions for, for the, for the song, you know, um, and, you know, I, more than one person in my early career told me that, you know, they thought I was overplaying and, and, and they were right. You know, I, I appreciate that. 
but this was a time yeah so i i it was it was like a thing in my head like i'm gonna i'm not no more double bass you know i'm just gonna go out with one bass drum one pedal and and at the ends of shows i'm gonna make people come up and say that was just one bass drum or one pedal so you know my youth that's that's okay and it, and it, that's... Did, it did happen you know people would come up to me and, and say that so it was like yeah mission accomplished and you know it was silly but that that's that's what was going on it was like i was kind of into the idea of paring down mm -hmm. and and you know making as much happen with the with as little as possible and even that you know if you're not careful that can be a, a mistake you know if, yeah if your mission is just well i just want to be able to do you know i've i've seen comments uh when I was playing that two piece kit, people saying, you know, uh, I would have thought, you know, I would have thought he was playing, uh, you know, comments on Facebook from the, from back in the day, you know, like remembering back. I would have thought he was playing. I had heard Dave, you know, play more shit on a two piece drum set. You would than than I've heard people play on, you know, a 20 piece drum set. And it's like, is that a compliment? You know, I know they meant it as a compliment, yeah. but as you as you mature, you know, you wonder. Well, was that a good thing that you were doing, Dave? Or, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? This is so great because we are talking about shit that is so important for other drummers to to know. You know what I mean? And learn. And you're you're given like a real open, honest assessment of like where you were at that time and you're, you've looked back at it and thought yeah i was young i was this i was that i think this is so great this is like you're 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 peeling back you know the curtain so to speak yeah well thanks man i appreciate that yeah. you know it's definitely something i can offer you know I, it's something we can all offer if we are reflective and honest with the way we with what how we're reflecting and you know you look at you look back and see what you might have been doing that wasn't necessarily the best choices and uh that's one of the great things about teaching one of the things i love the most about teaching is i can i can hip a 20 year old person to something that i didn't figure out until i was 35 or 40 or 45 or even 50 yeah you know and that's that's, that's great. a great, great place to, a great position to be in. I, 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 I um, uh, I, I'm grateful for that. Like, uh, it's a privilege. That's the word. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's kind of a, a privilege to, to be able to do that, you know? Um, and I kind of get off on it. Like, you know, like I, I'm giving you something that you can start to utilize now at 20, you know, that's why you're paying me. That's mm -hmm. what you're paying me for that kind of stuff, you know, and that shit's invaluable, you know, I, absolutely you should, you should yeah. pay for that, you know, at 20 years old, if someone can hip you to that stuff. And, uh, you know, I've studied, I studied with a, couple of i'm not going to name any names I, all my teachers were were great but there was one guy in particular who you know he was an awesome teacher and he's had some of the greatest drummers as students in the world but he did not offer any of that kind of stuff you know it was all very sort of practical and it was awesome i yeah. learned so much from this guy but i didn't learn that kind of stuff Yep. yep, from this guy, you know. So anyway, I I, just, I know what you're I'm saying. Happy to be in that position. Yeah, no, and I'll, and I'll just just to, to put a, a a cap on that. Yeah, I, I you're talking about like in addition to like you say practical stuff, you're also imparting like life stuff that that is like so huge, which is I think is a, a, a missing could be a missing piece of it for some people taking studying with a teacher that they're getting all this other great valuable information, but but what you're talking about is huge to, to like someone who wants to go and do this for the rest of their life as a career and as a, as a, you know, as a living, you've got to know that stuff. Like 
had a teacher say, yeah, you know, I, I did this, but I realized later that, that you know, that wasn't going to work. It wasn't maybe the, the best choice or however you would say it. It's, I think that's huge. I do. Yeah. And I don't take that lightly. I, I really appreciate being in that. I feel fortunate being in that position. And, and so, you know, life, um, yes, but, but it, it, in addition to that, like, so there's the practical things that you can impart on people. And then on the other side, there's the, like the, the human life things, you know, that you can share. And then in the middle of that, there's also just being a good musician, yeah. a good team player, um, that is, uh, you know, I, I, like I make the distinction. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm the only one who makes this distinction, but for me, I make the distinction between, you know, being a, a, a there are a lot there are a lot of great drummers out there who aren't necessarily great musicians. You could play the shit out of a drum set; doesn't mean you're a great musician. It means you're you're a great drummer, and and if if that's as far as you want to take it that's that's cool you know but if if you want to play with other people you you got to take it further than just having your chops and your vocabulary and your timing uh and, and i would say even your sound mm -hmm. it's got to go beyond all that and uh there was you know i heard someone say that way back when i was young uh like a teenager, you know, there are no great drummers under the age of 30. And, and, uh, and I think my, my take on that now at 53 is, well, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Now that's not entirely true. I mean, Tony yeah. Williams was a fucking great drummer. Jo yeah. uh, Steve Gadd was a, you know, John Bonham was 20 years old when he made Zeppelin one. Right. Or 21. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, no, I think, you, I think you're right. right. Yeah. So, so while that's not entirely true, there is truth to it. Because I think mm -hmm. for most of us, it takes time to get that musical aspect of it. Go beyond just being a great instrumentalist to, to you know, graduating to become a great, becoming a great musician. Yeah. And that... That did take me time, you know, if I look back. Now, you know, but so so it's like you could poke holes in almost anything. I could even poke a hole in that further and say, well, you know, I was 22 when I played on uh, th this first Chromax record that I did. And that, that, I, I have a hard time saying this, but I'm just going to say it. I think that was great metal drumming. Like, that's that's the vast majority of the stuff that I've done in my career. I never want to listen to again. Mm -hmm. There's stuff on YouTube that I will never watch again. Cause I just don't <laughs> like it, but it's out there and you know, yeah. but I'm not going to watch it. Um, <laughs> there are a few things that, you know, I'll go to YouTube every once in a while and I'll, 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 I'll look at it, you know, and be like, yeah, Dave, that was that was some shit, man. You sound good. Um, so, <laughs> but there's so much stuff that I'm like, oh my god, it makes me cringe. Like I, I don't want to watch it. I don't want anybody to watch it. But it's out there. Um, but this, you know, so that Chromax record, you know, I I I did a good job, you know, and I wasn't thirty. Yeah. So so there's room for play in there it's like it's not a hard and fast truth but there is truth to it you've got to go I, beyond if you want to play with you know with the musicians other musicians you gotta you gotta go beyond just being a great drummer yeah, yeah. and i would and just I venture just to say dave that that you're one of those few guys like you mentioned you know tony and gad and and bonham and you put jeff Picaro in that category too of like playing on these records at a young age but you and i think a lot a lot of credit certainly goes to your dad for exposing you to all these different styles. But you had you had this depth by the time you were in your 20s of 
going beyond being a metal drummer, you know what I mean? Like, like the ultra blue gig or, um, two ton shoe in the mid nineties, you know what I mean? Before you reached 30, you were, you had already started to expand your palate. So, you know, I, let's on that point, let's take it a step further then and say, and this is just my opinion of myself. Yeah. Yes. I became a versatile drummer in my twenties. But I don't think in terms of, I think in terms of metal and hard rock, yeah, I had that shit down and it wasn't just as a drummer. I, I, I was, I was playing musically and I was serving the music in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. But as I ventured out into these other styles of music, um, I think that's where, you know, things like touch and, and, you know, the, the notes that you don't play and making choices like Dave Maddox, our good buddy, Dave Maddox, Mm. uh, he calls it editing, you know, becoming a good editor. It's like, if you're a writer, you hire an editor, but as a musician, you've got to be your own editor. You know, you can't send the work out for somebody to edit for you. It's like you're making right. it right there. You've got to make it happen. And that that's where I think, uh, I know that's where I was, you know, a little short on on skill and perspective uh, that I needed. I just needed a few more years uh, to get there. So, look, yeah. I love that you appreciated what i did it it means a lot to me um and i appreciate what i did too you know i I, i'm not just like saying you sucked when you were in your 20s (laughs) except for as at metal you were good at metal um but you know you know my my motto in when i was 20 years old even when i was 25 years old was hit the drums as hard as you can as consistently as you can and i had people telling me supporting that you know the first like major recording session i did that at the end of one of the tracks i cut the engineer was in the control room he stood up and and gave me a like a standing ovation and 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 that was really meaningful to me, like really impactful to me because I yeah. was young, I was 19 years old and, you know, we were making a record, you know, and, and that's huge. And I, you know, so that kind of feedback was great. But the, the, along with that, you know, appreciation was what he appreciated was how hard and how consistent I was hitting and my timing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like I took that, you know, I took that to heart and I put it in my back pocket. And it was like, yeah, I'm doing the right, I'm doing the right thing, you know. And when you start stepping out into, you know, like Steve Gad, your great friend, legendary Steve Gad, he could, he could, he, I'm sure he still can, he could freaking lay lay into those snare drum on two and four he could hit that that front beat on the bass drum too and lay into that shit but he also could you know he, he and that's one of the things i think that goes into becoming a great musician is is yeah. is adjusting your touch it's like yep. you know you walk into one conversation with with a group of people and they're talking about you know uh you know civil engineering and 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 you know, you have to bring a certain vernacular to that and a certain, or, or another, you're talking to your son about something very delicate and you have to bring a certain, not just vernacular, but a certain tone, a certain touch. Mm-hmm. And, and so in a way, I think what I was doing, I was, I was bringing my like, err into yeah. everything. So when I was playing with Ultra Blue, it was, I was still in that mentality of like, hit the drums hard all the time. And I just, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that way anymore. And I don't, and, and you can't just change your thought. You then have to, if you have that realization, then you have to, 
actualize it. You can't just have the thought and then the skills are there automatically. You know, right. you have to, you have to do the hours yeah. touching the instruments in, in a different way. Well, so I think I, I, that's, that was part of the process for me. Yeah. yeah. And I was just going to say, Dave, a great example is I, I have to think playing with Josh Groban. I mean, talk about a discipline, you know, having to have discipline in your playing, right? I mean, that's not a gig. That's a gig where you got to blow in certain instances. You had your moments, but that's a, that's a gig where he's, he wants it solid, consistent, dependable, right? I mean, that's a good, well, no, jo the Josh Groban gig was, is a, a good example um, because, you know, we're doing a, arena tours. Yeah. And I, I, I immediately went back to my sort of, okay, we're hitting everything hard and big. But see, that's another thing is I learned how to hit hard with more grace and, and beauty, I would call it. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I'm not trying to blow my own horn, but I, I know how to play big now Yes, yep. and not necessarily hard. You know, I can play big and wide now. Whereas I think when I was 20 years old, more of my shit was a little narrower. It was like I was big and, you know, hard versus big and wide. And yeah. big and yep. wide implies like you have to take something off of it. You know, it's like you can't just... It's like a baseball player. You can't just swing for the fences and, you know, flex your muscle and go, Argh! it's like there's a grace to it that you learn. There's a beauty to it that you learn. And and so I was able to bring that to the Josh Groban gig. Um, and then at the same time, Josh's gig, uh, you got to be versatile. You know, you got to play brushes. Yeah. There was times I was shaking something in my right hand and, playing a brush in my left hand and then dropping that and picking up a stick and keeping this going and then dropping this and playing with two sticks and then picking it back up, you know, stuff like that uh, challenged me in a good way. Um, but you know what? I think probably the thing that has helped me most in terms of my dynamics and my touch was... Um, and still is, is playing smaller places where you actually have a PA. So you're in a small room, but there's a PA, mm -hmm. you know, because you could play some sort of small places and there's no PA and you feel like, well, I kind of have to lay into these drums to make sure, even though it's not a huge place, you want to make sure that people over in that far corner are, are getting you and feeling yeah. you. Um, but when you play a small place with a PA, you know, that's where I really feel like my now acquired skills of being able to simmer, play down, but, but make, I call it like, you know, you want to make the people want to take their clothes off. Like you want it, you want it to be sexy no matter what volume it is you want it to be you know visceral no matter what the volume is and speaking on this topic again peter erskine was one of my early lessons in on this topic and i can't believe i've never shared this with peter uh thanks to you and some other people i've had you know a few a handful of occasions where i've got to hang with peter and i've never told him this mm. but uh you know, he taught me a great lesson without knowing it. Um, Cause at that time when I, before I was really getting it yet, I went to see Peter at Great Woods and we were late cause we were drink. Well, we were hanging out in the parking lot and the band started. And so we beelined it and, and the, and it was sounded amazing. It sounded like somebody just turned the most high end massive home stereo on. And, and was it, it Steely Dan? Dead. Was yeah, it? it was actually the New York Rock and Soul Review, I think. Oh, okay. Which was Steely Dan and uh, Boss Skaggs. And... Boss Skaggs, Phoebe yeah. Snow. It was such a great show. And anyway, in my mind, as I'm walking in, I'm thinking like Peter must be 
laying in because I don't remember what song it was, but it was, you know, it was a backbeat, middle, medium tempo. Uh, and in my mind, I was projecting what I think, what I thought I would have been doing based on what I was hearing. Yeah. You know, and I could only imagine that that's what Peter was doing. And when I, when we, when we got in, we had lawn seats and this, so we, we come in, the stage is down here and I look to my right and Peter's farthest stage left. Mm -hmm. So he's the first thing you see when I walked in and he was, Oh, I'm on a short tether here. He was doing this. Never, I don't think he lifted his arm to hit the snare drum the entire night. And there was none of this, yeah. you know, on the hi-hat. It was, you know, if he was playing, you know, it was more of a, like a, a lateral versus a, you know, a big up and down thing. It was, yeah. it was all very yeah. like what I call low profile. You know, if you're like looking at someone from a profile, you know, is it, is it a high profile or is it, you know, is it low? And, and, and so that's what I've, I've, that's one of the, I'd say major things that, uh, that I worked on later, you know, like, probably starting in my well it was, it was yeah my mid 20s i started working on that but it took me a while because it, it, it's still that old thing still kicks in still to this day yeah i yeah, want sure. to hit things hard based on what i'm what i'm hearing uh or what i think should happen but so it's 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 still a work in progress but i can do it now like i know how to like if you take a picture from me of me from here up I know how to make you want to take your clothes off, John, and you won't know I'm doing anything. <laughs> I always do when I see you. I mean, I want to. I don't always take them off, but I want to take them off. You want to, yeah. I so, do. So, yeah, man, I want, I want to move people without moving that much when it's appropriate. You know? yeah. And I couldn't do that Dig so it. well when I was 20 years old. No. By the way, I have to tell you, this... This comment came in a little while ago from our friend Uli Salazar, who sends you big love. Uli. You're a Ludwig man. What's up, Uli? Uli, good to see you, brother. Um, I have to tell everybody too, Dave, because I don't know that this, this was never anything that was um, made public to the world, but the big Steve Gadd tribute that Zildjian did in 2003 at Berkeley. Yeah. Um, I think you remember this. It, that we had, we had Vinnie... Co yeah, scared, scared the shit, shit out of you. you we had, we had yeah, Vinnie Kalayuta and and my good friend Rick Murata, um, who we saw last night for dinner. In fact, here on the vineyard, uh, paying tribute Rick to Murata. Steve. I just want to make that official. I love you, Rick Murata. I, I love him too. Your sound. He's so, something so, else. Go on. So so. so, so and planning this massive event that was two years in the, in the planning and. It comes down to, I don't know what it was, a, a month or maybe even just a matter of a couple of weeks before we come to find out Vinny gets called to, to do these dates with Sting right before the event, which was September 2003. And so I'm on the phone with Vinny about it. And basically the last date is the day before the show. So Vinny's like, it's cool. I'll get on a plane. I'll, I'll be coming from London. I'll get into Boston at whatever time in the afternoon do a rehearsal, do the show that night. And it was, <laughs> and I remember thinking like, oh man, this, this has problems, potential problems written all over it. So we had, we had this team of people at Zildjian that were putting this event on with myself and, and, and I said, we need to get someone that can be ready to go at a moment's notice and play this show because we couldn't have all this music that was just, planned that Vinny was going to play, you know, that was going to honor Steve without a drummer. So I called you and I scared the shit out of you initially, <laughs> but, but I have to tell you, Dave, we had a Rob Wallace, your good friend and mine and, and Paul Siegel from Hudson, they were helping produce this. They, they videotaped it for us. 
And we had a team of people at Zildjian, all of whom knew you. And everybody agreed that Dave DeCenzo could do this. He could walk in there, let them know what the songs are ahead of time, and he'll play the shit out of it if, if we have to call on him to do it at the last minute. And, uh, uh, so, so two things. I, I'm so <laughs> honored, you know, and, and flattered that, that you would think of me in that capacity to be able to, you know, jump in like that and, and fill in for Vinny. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, it scared the shit out of me, man. Like <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, especially in 2003, I was still uh, something I haven't been talking about that much lately. I've been doing a fair amount of interviews and such. Um, but I had, um, terrible tendonitis in my wrist and my, my forearm. It has since gone up into my, they call it bicep tendonitis. And I forgot, I forgot about the forearm. Yeah. And yeah, it, I forgot it, about that. It really created a lot of problems for me. And a lot of the problems were mental because it got to my head. Like, I don't know if I'm going to lose, if my hand's going to go numb in the middle of a song because that shit happens you know that was that was a fairly regular occurrence and in metal you know um it it's it sucked but if i had to i could freaking i could hold the stick like you know with my fist and at least play backbeats you know and it would get that bad occasionally yeah but if you're playing you know night sprite and your arm goes numb you're you're screwed and, and, you know, that was at the time I was playing with Hiromi, actually. And uh, right. so I was, I was playing some, you know, some heavy fusion music at the time. And I was having those problems, you know. And I was seeing my physical therapist on a regular basis, our buddy Dana Spellman. Um, and I was, yep. you know, using Tiger Balm patches. And, like, I was on a regiment for my left arm. And... Um, and so that was a big part of the the fear at the time. And I had that sort of in general. It wasn't just about that, you know, filling in for Vinny. But, you know, uh, along with, with, with the tendonitis, you put filling in for Vinny and playing the, this, this repertoire. Yeah, it, it, was, oh. it was daunting. And yeah. I'm so glad I didn't have to do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, and I'm certainly not making light. I know that that was a huge, like, it, it, I, I could, I could picture you on the other end of the phone taking like four steps back when I called you, like, whoa, what? Like you were honored, but you were like, I think you even said like, like Johnny, are you sure about this or something? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I have no doubt. And and seriously, I, I know, you know, if if it ever came down to it, you would have. You would have gotten absolutely it, nailed it. I would have gotten yeah. it done. Yeah. But I, I might not have slept the night before uh, out of nerves. And I wouldn't have gotten it done as well in 2003 as I would now uh, that I've developed. I've just developed more. You know? And my, uh, my, I've improved my technique. I don't, I don't experience as mm. much of that. Not nearly as much of that, actually. Um, as I was, you know, almost 20 years ago. So yeah, I'd feel better about it now, but yeah, that was, uh, I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. You thought highly enough of my abilities to, to do that. No, had no question. And, and, and we're, believe it or not, Dave, we're coming up on two hours and oh I, it's, goodness. I know. And I, we started late because of my technical, um, difficulties, but I, you mentioned Hiromi and I just, I want to set something up for you to tell a story, but. I don't, I'm, and you, you have a way better recollection of the dates than I do, but I know that I had told Steve Smith about you years ago, like probably in the late 80s, early 90s, and he kind of knew you as my friend, Dick DeCenzo's kid. And you know Steve well now, so, so you can laugh at that. But at the time, you were, you know, you were whatever, 20 years old, and he knew who your dad was, so you were like, yeah, your friend, Dick DeCenzo's kid. And then I think... I don't know if you must have met before my wedding was actually my wedding was 20 years ago this Thursday, 2001, June 24th. Kelly's. Wow. Was that Kelly? 
That was Kelly, yeah. I just reminded her she's forgotten that our anniversary is Thursday. So she's rushing out now to get a gift. Yeah, right. But no, but uh, but I remember sort of either introducing or reintroducing you guys at the wedding, and and maybe even you guys hanging out a bit, and then. And then the Hiromi gig, then you were playing with Hiromi a couple of years later. Yep. And you were in San Francisco. Yeah. And he was, and I think he was planning to come see you, right? Yes. It's okay. An yeah. Story it is. You've got to tell the story. So, um, I, uh, I, I'm just thinking right now, like, uh, you know, do you know Michael Vosbeen? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think he's watching, in fact. Oh, really? Yeah, he yeah, told me my to, to how to fix my echo, echo problem, problem, but I don't, I don't think, think that's, that's the problem. problem. Um, but thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, so Michael is doing these things called drummer stories, right? Yes. And I just did one for him, and this is the story I told. Oh, great! Okay. So I hope I hope you don't mind, Michael. I'm gonna I'm gonna it's gonna there's gonna be some overlap here. Um, I won't. I won't tell it quite as excitingly right now for John as I did for you, Michael. Okay, I'll make it a little more drab. But this was an amazing story, man. Um, Hiromi was still a relatively new artist. Um, you know, she she had she was signed, and uh, she had at least one, maybe two records out by now. I think she had her second record out. Mm -hmm. I played on her first record and I did her first tours. And then I, I, I just, I left that situation because for various reasons, it had nothing to do with Hiromi. Um, but, uh, so she was still a relatively new artist. She, and her management, I can only imagine was trying to save, you know, pinch pennies, save some mm -hmm. money. And I was subbing, so I was no longer in the band, but her drummer couldn't do a couple of dates out in the West Coast. I see. And one of them was at Yoshi's uh, in, I think it's in Oakland, not San Francisco, but I flew yeah, in. Yeah, Oakland, Francisco. right. So, right. Um, so they book me a flight the same day of the gig from Boston, you, you know? So, yeah. And, and it's at the crack of ass in the morning, you know, so I had to get up at like 4 a.m., catch this flight out of Logan. They don't even book me a direct flight. If you're watching Hiromi's manager, if you're watching, thanks a lot for that one. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, as highly as I can speak about Hiromi, I can speak as, as lowly about her management company at the time. Um, so they booked me a connection at, uh, O'Hare. And mm. so we're circling around O'Hare for long enough where I miss my connection. Sure. So, um, and, uh, okay. So long story short, I, I, uh. I'm like three hours late arriving in San Francisco. My car service is no longer there. Um, mm. I think I, I had a cell phone, like one of those like big clunky ones. At yeah. The time. <laughs> yeah. And so I was able to make some calls, but I get, so I get to San Francisco and they have, so I travel with my, my double pedal at the time. I was traveling with symbols and and a stick bag mm -hmm. and of course clothes you know a suitcase with some clothes all of which had disappeared by the time i get to san francisco none of that stuff arrived so Made now not only am i like three hours late and i have no car to get to the club i have to wait in line to report my my lost luggage and lost instruments <sighs> and 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 now I got to get to Oakland from the San Francisco airport, and and um, so again, long story short, this was a crazy like I don't even remember how I got there, um, 
I, you know, I like I took a, I think I took a train at one point, a bus, a taxi. Um, and I show up. I finally show up. So on my way, uh, I must have been in, you know, taxi or a train or a bus at one point. And I call Steve because I knew he had let me know he was coming to the show. Yeah. yeah. And he was already on his way to the gig. I wasn't even there yet. And I say, do you happen to have any sticks <laughs> on you? And just, just as a matter of fact, yes, I, I actually have a pair of sticks in the back seat, something like that. And uh, so, man, you know, it was just, it was so cool because the show ended up going so well. And, you know, Steve was a big influence on me, you know, so to have Steve oh, yeah. showing up was was quite an honor for me, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I really, you know, I always, we all always want to do good. You know, it could be the sure. smallest gig or the biggest gig of your life. You want to, you know, you don't want to, you want to do well, but now I've got Steve Smith, one of my, you know, childhood drumming heroes is showing up to see me play. And I've got, I don't have my double pedal. And that was a big deal for me. I, I bring a double pedal. I bring my pedals because they're so important to me. Like I, I, I would rather do without just about anything else other than pedals. Like I need to feel that that DW five thousand turbo feeling under my feet. It's a big mm -hmm. deal to me. So I'm traveling with that, and that's gone. <laughs> my symbols are gone. Um, I show up to the club, and they've got a pile of broken up battered sticks in the dressing room that drummers have left you know so thank goodness steve has a fresh pair of sticks and they felt good in my hands and that was another thing like i hope they're not like eight yeah. days you know uh or these you know toothpicks um they felt good uh they they managed to get me a, a double pedal which actually felt good as well and the cymbals i don't think they were great but you know, by that time, I told Michael this too, uh, by that time I had just, I'd stopped caring. Yeah. I, yeah. Like I could have the worst gig of my life and it, I, I'm not even going to blame myself because this is a fiasco. And everything was like, it, we did two sets that night and they both were like killing sets. Like I was really comfortable. I used Steve sticks the whole time. They didn't break. And, uh, and it was just, it was awesome, man. So it, yeah. was a, it was a very happy ending to a very uh, long and stressful day. Remember, I started at 4 a.m. in Boston. Yeah. And, you know, we now I'm on the West Coast and, you know, we do two <laughs> sets. So it's a long night. 24 it's, hours you were awake. 24 basically. hours, yeah. E easily. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I know and what so, you mean. And I was going to go ahead. Sorry. So, no. So it's just just it's just a cool story, right? Like. You're, you're, one of your drumming it. heroes just happens to be coming to see you play and, and you don't have sticks and he's got a pair of sticks and it's like, boom, you know, it worked. That's, and it, was that the first, first time, he probably the first time he saw you play, right? Um, I think so, yeah. I, I think I, 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 I remember think so. actually him emailing you and you forwarded the email to me saying, man, I didn't know, uh, I, knew, I knew Dave... I knew yeah. Dick, your Dick's son could play. No, he didn't say that, but I knew he could play, you know, rock and metal, but I didn't know he could, you know, play like jazz fusion with a trio. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, that, you know, I say this stuff because it's meaningful to me. Yeah. Like, I'm again, I'm not trying to blow my own horn by saying Steve Smith likes what I do. It was meaningful to me. Like, you sending that to me and sharing that was like, you know, it, 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 it props you up. You know, it makes you, it makes you feel more confidence and more motivation to keep going. Yep. You don't want to let it prop you up in a false sense. You want it to inspire you to keep working, you know, and exactly. that's, that's what it did. And so I you appreciate could, stuff like that. I, I, I do stuff I, like that for me. Well, thank you for saying that. Thank you. And I was just going to say, I, I could never in a million years imagine you ever getting ahead of your skis with anything like that. And, and seriously, I, I knew you were just after hearing the story. I think he told me, Steve told me maybe before you did what happened. 
and the horrible day that you had. So I just thought like, and, and I, the reason I asked if that was the first time he'd seen you play, because I remember he, from that day on, you were no longer Dick Desenzo's kid. You were Dave Desenzo. And he became a huge fan of yours. And he, he sang to this day, sings your praises, but he was like, man, that, that kid plays his ass off. He was like, holy shit. I, you told me he was good, but I, I didn't, you're right. I think he thought like, in my little narrow world, I said, well, yeah, he's a great rock metal drummer. You should, you know, hear how fast he can play double bass drums. He, he saw for himself this wide, huge vocabulary that you at that point had and still have, obviously. So I, I really wanted to hear you tell the story because it's so great. I love that story, man. That's why I shared it with Michael, too, for his podcast. Um, it's, it's the first story that comes to my mind if like somebody asked me for you know a cool story about my drumming career uh that was a that was a good one yeah yeah that was a good one that well buddy we should stay john that was a long <laughs> ass day <laughs> it was a long ass day i should i should, I should um know. let you get some of this beautiful is it how's the weather up there today by the way actually i forgot to open my window uh pull the draw the blinds but uh it was it was over oh no it's it was well, no it's raining oh it is okay i think it's gonna rain down here later yeah i saw some yeah. sun out the back window earlier it was looking yeah it's nice, still but... it's still sunny it's beautiful it was beautiful this oh, morning yeah. i saw a deer in the backyard when i got up this morning really yeah, yeah. big do one they, too do they, do they like uh bring the did they bring the deer over on the boats and stuff <laughs> Are you, in, <laughs> are you in Edgar Town? Yeah, we're in Edgar Town. <laughs> nice, man. <laughs> they, that's a funny thing. We wonder the same thing. Like, they, they swam over here, I don't know how many thousand years ago, but there's a shitload of deer. It, it's crazy. Yeah. They must be expensive. You know, they got to import them and shit. And everything that's right. expensive over there. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. But well, anyway. I have a lot of history uh, with the vineyard. You know, my, my parents had a timeshare in uh, Vineyard That's H right. for, for 40 years. Wow. Yeah, my mom is just you told me that. to sell it, actually. She's gone down a couple of times by herself since my dad passed. Oh, God, God bless God. Mary. Yeah. Wow. She's, she's amazing. So um, the vineyard is near and dear to my heart, man. I... I and Lori's too, because when we got together, um, we would take a week every summer from their timeshare because they wouldn't mm -hmm. use all their weeks. Um, all, you know, they didn't always use all their weeks. So Lori and I got to spend some quality time, man, down there. That's uh, great. I, uh, it's just a beautiful place. I'm glad you're. Uh, are you down there for the summer now? We're coming back uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday, and then we go down. I have a gig. Saturday in Marshfield and then we have another gig next Thursday the 1st of July and then we come down on the 2nd and we're here till more or less till September come home for a couple of days in August yeah nice man what's the farthest so, north you get with your band like Woburn is that it yeah we we actually Andover we get up to Andover okay yeah I want to come see you guys sometime okay I'm sure you've had a lot of drummers come see you i had a few come yeah, yeah. it's uh have you played joe rosenblatt came to see us a uh, couple of years ago nice he and just it's moved to rhode island he did yeah right isn't that strange i i saw wow. it, i saw it on facebook or instagram i gotta Gosh. reach out i didn't know that yeah but you know to, to your point dave it would be the same thing if you walked in the room joel had had a gig that night at um place in Boston that oh god oh, that's Kelly <laughs> playing her ride beat um what what's the what oh the city winery or some place like that in in Boston so he he called to invite me to the gig and I said actually my band's playing Saturday night at this Chinese restaurant in Wakefield and and he's like give me the address I'm going to come see you when I'm done with my gig so halfway through the last set you know, you can't miss Joel. He's six foot four or something. Yeah, yeah, Comes walking in, big smile on his face. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if 
but he was so generous. He was so kind. It was a great to see. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, I'm gonna. I want to come. I want to come hang sometime. I uh, I keep my eye out. Um, because uh, I I do see your your posts from time to time. Grand Theft Audio. 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 Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. we we steal, steal music, music, not cars. cars. Nice, nice man. And you <laughs> well, sing, right? I, 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 I uh, uh, yeah, not no, well, but a little bit. bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, you must sing well enough. I mean, you sing lead, right? Yeah. yeah. Couple, Couple songs. songs. I could picture you singing. You got that silky. Oh, you're a great singer sing too. In your voice. Thank you. Thank and you. you're a great you're singer. singer. Thanks, man. man. I don't have you any silk, but I, I can I can <laughs> I can belt you, some you, scratchy shit out. You got you soul. soul. You got <laughs> huge quantities of soul. <laughs> Thanks, man. Absolutely. Johnny, Buddy, this, this is has so been great, man. Yeah, so likewise. Great. And 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 I promise if it's, if it's not, not during the couple of days I'm back in the summer, at the end of the summer we're gonna have that face to face hang we keep saying we're gonna do. I yeah. love that. Yeah, um, me too. I'll 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 drive south. We'll hook up for a And I'll drive north. We'll meet somewhere in the middle. Sounds good, man. Cool. Thanks so much right. for having me, John. Oh, thanks, thanks so much for doing this, Dave. This has been so great. I think you've given so much great. I'm looking at the comments here that you can look at later. Um, great inspiration, great information, and um, it's been fantastic. Thank you, man. And, and and again, it's really nice to be able to talk about my dad. It's uh, Thank, yeah. It's really nice for me, especially Great. with I'm, someone like you who knew him very well. It's yeah. It's nice. Thanks, thanks, yeah, Dad. I mean, I, I'm I'm saying, I'm saying thanks because I appreciate you. You know, wanting, wanting to talk, to talk about, about him as much as you did, and and uh, it, I really I enjoyed that too. That was I, I miss your dad like crazy. Yeah. Thanks, man. Me too. All right. Well, hang tight for a minute. I still have your message, by the way. Oh, wow. You left a message the day he died. You left a voicemail on my phone. and Wow. I saved it. I saved wow. it. I listen to it every once in a while. It brings a little tear to my eye, and it's good, you know? It's good. I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. you. That, 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 that is unbelievable. I, you know, and I, I told you this at the time. I know we spoke about it a bunch of times afterward, but your dad, and, and I should have said this at the very beginning, but I would say he single-handedly created this community that we now have, that we love, you know, of drummers in our, in our area. It was your dad, man. It was, he, he brought everybody together and he still does. Oh, that's so great. That's so, it's just so nice to hear you say that, man. I, yeah. Yeah. And I feel so grateful for the times that we lived through and that we got to experience because uh, it's different now. You know, I, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying now sucks and the past was great. It's just it's different. And uh, and I feel lucky that that we got to live that. And and I appreciate you saying that about my dad and I. And, because I, I, it is true. And, you know, man, that's another thing I wish I got to tell him. You know, uh, I, 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 I hope in some ways I, I did tell him that I, I know what you've done, not just for me, but for, for our community. Um, I think I you think did, Dave. I really do. Yeah. I think, I think so you were able you to. Even if, John, for, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say, even if you didn't say it exactly like that, I think your actions and, and, and you, the human that you are, conveyed that to him. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. I, I, I hope that's true. And I'm going to choose to believe that. I'm going to choose to believe what you're saying. And thank you for saying that about, about him. Because uh, it's just nice to hear it. Uh, somehow that makes me... Just hearing you say that, man, it just makes me feel good, and uh, good. I appreciate it, man. He was absolutely a hell of a hell of a dude, and he uh, he did he did give us a lot. That, yeah, yeah. That, you're right. We 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 can we can end it on that note. He did give us a lot. Yeah, yeah. Cool, and it was good to learn. Uh, we'll end it on this note. It was good to learn 
for me that you actually knew him bef- that you had experiences with him before uh the shop and before yeah. Zildjian. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. That's neat, man. Well, you know, if we do this again sometime, I can share and we will. I can I there's still more stuff I can share about him like his early days and him, you know, being uh you know, working for the drum companies and and uh him opening up areas uh yeah absolutely um my mom has told me some cool stories i uh, i would love to hear hear those stories stories, dave so let's do another one of these at the end of the summer or in the fall sounds good man yeah Yeah. sounds good john all right buddy buddy. love Love you lots lots. love you too hang hang with me for one second dave i'll end the live stream and then we'll sure we'll hang in the room for a second absolutely all right big hand for dave desenzo everybody Thanks, John. Thanks, Dave. See you in a second. Okay.